Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Peter Goddard, Director of the Institute for Advanced Study, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon to this lecture in the series Art and Its Audiences, which is this series being organized this year by Yves Alain Bois of our School of Historical Studies and Bridget Alsdorf of the Department of Art and Archaeology at uh, Princeton University. This series seeks to reflect on art's relationship to its individual and collective audiences, examining the ways in which art has historically addressed, activated, conditioned, or excluded its viewers. Today's lecture will be given by John Baines. John Baines is professor of Egyptology in the University of Oxford and a fellow of the Queen's College. This year, he is a member in our School of Historical Studies where he is working on elite self-representation in ancient Egypt. Professor Baines took his bachelor's degree in ancient Egyptian from the University of Oxford in 1967 and his doctorate there in 1976, the same year that he was elected professor of Egyptology in that university at the age of 30. But he had ventured out of Oxford before that, having been a lecturer in Egyptology in the University of Durham from 1917 to 1975. Professor Baines is the recipient of many awards, too numerous to list, but including a Mellon Distinguished Achievement Award in 2004. Today, his subject will be, who were artists in ancient Egypt and what audiences did they address? The respondent to the lecture will be Deborah Vizhak, postdoctoral fellow and lecturer in the Department of Art and Archaeology at Princeton University. And the program will end with an opportunity for questions from the audience followed by a reception to which you're all invited in the Ford Hall Common Room. And now let's welcome Professor Baines. Thanks very much. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, uh, it's on. <laughs> Um, so, I, last year I was asked to talk about artists in Egypt. Uh, actually, I was asked to talk about painting, but I ended up talking about artists. And this year I was asked to talk about audiences, and I, what I'm going to talk about is somewhere between those two, I think we might say. Um, and uh, there, is a, there is a basic problem with pre-Western and pre-modern traditions of art that the artist is not somebody who has an individual identity most of the time. And so we have to think about who the artist is in order also to think about who the audience might be. And that affects any period and context and any art form. And so I'm afraid that I shall be ranging very widely. Roughly, I'll go in chronological order. And I want to suggest that there are ways of thinking about this sort of problem by bringing it down into little bits and thinking about it uh, in terms of the, those component bits, which I'll try to address one by one. Uh, we can uh, state the basic problem that a great deal of ancient Egyptian art is very small. Uh, an awful lot isn't, as people probably know. Uh, and it's also, it was placed in antiquity in places where nobody could go. Could go. So it's not a matter of having a simple type of audience. So in thinking about this, I thought it would be useful to break the group of people involved down into people such as uh, the executant. I'm starting in the middle there. The person who actually makes the object or um, organizes the event or whatever it might be. Uh, that person, the executant, is perhaps responsible to a patron. So the patron is the person who decides that this will happen and be created, <clears throat> provides the resources and that sort of thing. Uh, between those two people, you can have the designer, perhaps. The designer is someone who will say what it is that should be done, having been given the initial idea or the initial stimulus by the patron. Uh, and then once the work is created, people can see it. <clears throat> they can see it while it's being created. So you have an audience during the execution. And then when it is complete, you can look at it, except for the point that I just made that not many people do. Uh, however, we have to remember that Egyptian society doesn't consist only of people. Uh, so even if we were to 
uh, have a social hierarchy, so we have the king, the elite, the rest of the population, very broadly speaking. Uh, I've left out two further components who are extremely important, and they are the dead and the gods. And one must assume that the dead and the gods are part of the audience. And by making that basic assumption, we can then explain a little bit of why works that nobody could ever see would be just as perfect and expressed in the same idiom as works that people could see. But um, I don't know how many people do home decoration themselves, but I'm willing to bet that those who do probably move the furniture aside before painting a wall, and then they put the furniture back in position and then they, their beautiful painting work can't be seen anymore. And so you can say that this is a general human impulse to create something that is perfect. And I think that there's a lot of cross-cultural relevance in these issues of who the audience is and whether the fundamental audience, in a sense, is the human aesthetic sense. Well, um, those are just prefatory remarks, let's say. And uh, I'll now move first to show you where we are in Egypt. And uh, the red arrows there point to the various sites from which the material I'm going to show you comes. As you will see, the vast majority comes from the southern part of Egypt, which was a deeply provincial area for much of antiquity, but it's the area where things survived best. Uh, I shan't linger on that. Um, and now I move back into late prehistory to consider that uh, you have to have, right at the beginning of Egyptian art, um, or not at the beginning of Egyptian art, at the beginning of what I shall consider, uh, you have extraordinarily beautifully executed works of great elaboration, which require the existence of a separate group of people who acquire the expertise to do this, and a vast expenditure is involved. Now, unfortunately, that screen is very big. Fortunately for the people at the back, it is. And so you can't easily tell that that object is about that size. Uh, bear that in mind for plenty of what we see. Now, I actually once held a class with that object, which is in the Ashmolean Museum. And uh, you, you notice how the stone can laminate easily. And then you think, well, somebody must have designed this and then somebody carved it. And those are singular people I'm, I'm invoking, but they could have been several in both cases. And they could have spent weeks or months doing this, and then one false blow of whatever tool they were using could have shattered it, and they'd have had to start again. And so one has to remember the enormous expenditure and the enormous wastage that is likely to go into creating objects like this. Uh, you can also see the extreme complexity of the design there. I shan't go into that, there isn't time. But that object is about 200 years older than this one. And this one you will find in any book on ancient Egyptian art. Uh, it has the uh, characteristic on, on the right there, uh, the characteristic icon showing the king about to smite an enemy. And that is about the most public piece of ancient Egyptian art one can point to. It is something that was put on outside walls of temples and in places like that. Uh, that object is about the same size as the last one, perhaps a little bit bigger. Uh, and it was dedicated in a temple, at least if not in a temple, in some sort of a shrine. And so it was not for public consumption. Uh, it seems never to have been used. But the really important thing about it is, in a sense, neither of those points. It's that it um, embodies all the developed conventions that we find in later Egyptian art. And so there has been an enormous transformation in those approximately two centuries between those two works. Uh, and that this is something which must have been invested in by the rulers and by those they commissioned to create the new forms and conventions of what was then going to be standard for Egyptian art. There are other huge changes, um, notably that this is the latest such object known. They stopped making this type of material from then on. I think uh, if we perhaps we can do this for a second. If you go back, I think the actual quality of the carving on the older object is finer. And you notice that the older object had been broken and mended at the top. 
and it comes actually from the same find as the other one. So you could imagine that whoever designed that one knew the older one. And so you have a discourse there between the artists of different dates and those who commissioned and those who received. So we can talk about reception theory in a sense here. Uh, this second object, I think, was probably not a unique object. It would have been, uh, a number of examples of it would have been made, and it would then have been distributed among major places throughout the country. But I obviously, well, I can't prove that, but I think it's a reasonable supposition. So uh, we don't have significant architecture from prehistoric Egypt, but the moment the dynastic period comes, we do. And we can start with that little area there. Those are ground plans of mortuary enclosures created over a period of about 300 years <coughs> at Abydos. And uh, they, um, you read them roughly from top left to bottom right in chronological terms, not exactly. And the top left one, the smallest, is the one that's archeologically best known. It was excavated just a few years ago. And it turns out that it was built uh, sorry, that I'm misleading you. There are three enclosures there, one big one, one larger and two sm pretty small ones. Uh, they built a mud brick, and it can be shown archaeologically that they were destroyed very soon after construction. So this was a temporary form of architecture, presumably after the king had died. Then the next king transfers the mortuary cult, or whatever it may be, to the next building. These are very large uh, structures as they develop. Uh, and then the bottom left, sorry, the bottom right example is, uh, is now on the list of the world's most endangered monuments, I think. Uh, and there it is. Uh, and you can see how colossal it is. Uh, and the best photograph for seeing detail here is this one because you can see that it was originally plastered and painted white. It must have dominated the landscape. It is about 200 meters long and about just under 100 meters wide, so it is truly colossal. Uh, the detailed execution of this um, pattern in the brick is something that was extremely important uh, ideologically in this period. The only reason why that monument survives is almost certainly because it's the latest of the group, uh, and so then the king's burials were moved to another place, so the next king didn't come along to tear this one down. Uh, and so we then actually will move um, in a minute, but not straight away, to, uh, to its successor. Uh, but elsewhere in the country, they were constructing similar structures, and these were tombs. The, the previous ones are not tombs, they're enclosures for ritual performance. And there you have an example of one of these. And here you can think about, uh, also with what I'll show in a second, about how you do actually in, in, imply all sorts of further ideas in creating these buildings. <clears throat> so this is a tomb that's a superstructure reconstructed. And as you can see, it's highly decorated on the outside. It also has these low shapes around the side, and those are sacrificed retainers. And so the funeral would have been something where huge numbers of people would have been present and there will be this grisly business of burying the sacrificed people at the same time. I think that in, um, in a period when performance art is very much what people think about, we should say that the sacrifice of retainers is a form of performance art. Uh, it's maybe not one that we would love, but that's neither here nor there. And David Wengro has suggested that the actual detail of the decoration implies some sort of permeability to this structure. So it would be painted as if it had cloth all around it and the offerings could kind of waft through the walls. And then we can see uh, in a little bit more detail there, one of these tombs has this set of Bucrania modeled uh, on, a, on a bench that runs all around, more than 300 uh, sets of horns of cattle. Uh, and so a huge, a huge amount must have been deposited or, or enacted around this tomb when it was put into action. For the royal tombs, the conventions were different, but we shouldn't assume any less uh, action. Uh, and if 
300 cattle were sacrificed in order to feed the people at the funeral, then there would have been thousands of people present. But we can't actually make that assumption, although it's, it's possible. Uh, this isn't the only way in which you have a performance aspect to these tombs. So bottom right there, you see um, a stepped structure, which is actually inside one of these tombs. So this was built first, and so in some sense, the stepped structure must have a symbolic value that we don't know about. And this addresses an audience of perhaps the person who commissions the tomb, the person who is planning it for his death, uh, or his, his um, descendants who actually create the tomb. Uh, and then it is buried within the tomb itself. So the actual enactment of the to uh, creation of the tomb is an enactment. Well, at bottom left, I've just got an image of the burial chamber at the base of one of these tombs showing you how uh, the, uh, the expenditure involved in all of this goes underground as well as above ground. And just to indicate that they we're talking about something that's a widespread practice, we go about a thousand miles to the south, perhaps more, Karaman, Sudan, and you see this tumulus which has a stone, a sort of pebble structure, circular, defining it with a tomb shaft, top right. And then you've got this um, trench in which are hundreds of cattle horns. So it's the same idea as you saw at Saqqara at a date perhaps 500 years later, that sort of difference in time. We have to assume this is part of the way that elites treat their riches in terms of cattle uh, throughout Northeast Africa, effectively, in this sort of period. And if you think that that's an impressive wastage of cattle, you can think again, because here is a slightly later tomb where it's been counted there were 3,000 of these, and not just 300. Uh, the 3,000, I think, gets you beyond a point where you could imagine that this could be done for the funeral. And so we therefore have to think that you actually have a whole life of the tomb owner, which is probably measured out in the number of cattle that he receives as tribute or something like this. The skulls are then saved and then they are used in the burial. And so in terms of the enactment of what is going to create the work of art that is the tomb, uh, then this is something which affects the whole lifespan of the owner of the tomb, uh, or rather the whole lifespan probably after he became a leader. That, that's a very different sort of culture in certain ways, but I thought the parallel was still useful. So uh, going back to the period of those tombs that, in Egypt that we just saw, we can think that uh, you should not be narrow in how you understand what is a work of art. So I've been talking about performances, which certainly can and need to involve large numbers of people and probably be seen by still larger numbers of people. Here you have the ultimate in elite art for a very small audience. Uh, these are perfectly formed stone vessels that date to the first two dynasties in Egypt. Um, and uh, at the bottom right, you just have a group which is of different shapes. Most of those shapes can be paralleled in ceramic, but the, the lowest one in particular is a characteristic ceramic form. But the one on the left is a much more interesting thing in some ways. That imitates something that you may, made out, out of reeds. And you can see that the reed pattern is, is done on the underside as well as the top. But that's not the end of the cleverness that goes into this, because you have there this hieroglyph, which is written on one end of the edge, and that hieroglyph is the Egyptian word for gold. Uh, so you can either think, uh, it's difficult to say what that means, but it implies that this is part of a culture in which gold is the most valuable thing, which I'm sure it was, um, and either the object is for keeping gold in it, it's a jewelry um, tray, let's say, or alternatively, you should imagine that this object, which is made of perhaps of serpentine, a soft stone, uh, should be envisaged as being really made of gold. And so this, uh, a work like this is operating on many levels, and the gold hieroglyph can only address people who can read, uh, which would, might not include the person who commissioned it, who can say. Uh, so the patron is somebody we should give a little distance to there. 
And these stone vessels then occur in all sorts of forms. So on the left, you have a couple in the form of leaves, which are just amazingly, beautifully executed. And on the right, you have something which you can go and see in the Metropolitan Museum. It's only about this size, uh, and it consists of two hieroglyphs put together, which spell out uh, the idea of ka, which is the sort of vital force in Egyptian terms, and the idea of life. At the same time, there is a well-known person from this period who, had, who was called an ka, who had those two items formed into his name. It might have been a name vase for this person, but it's a libation vase at the same time. You can see how it's hollowed out so that uh, it can be used for pouring a liquid. And it is quite astonishingly virtuoso in its execution. Unfortunately, it's an art market piece, so we don't know where it comes from. Uh, so uh, quite a few of these stone vessels uh, from slightly later deposits have inscriptions on them. And these inscriptions, uh, some of them, demonstrate fairly well that the vessels were kept in use for some generations and that they were used by special groups of people who would have been performing rituals. So uh, although they are um, objects which come from tombs, they do testify to the use of such material in life and therefore to a, an audience. But they're, they're the last gasp, the last wonderful gasp of a technique which disappears because uh, the stone vessel lost its prestige to ve vessels made of metal. Uh, as you can see in these, this, is, this one is another double play of a different sort. That's a washing set, uh, which as you can see is made of gold. Uh, but the form of the pouring vessel is that of the stone vessel. I showed you two, two images back, that, the lower one, and the stone vessel is, imitates a ceramic form. So symbolically, this queen who had this as part of her mortuary gear was saying, I'm just a simple girl. I have ceramic vessels only because I'm not very poor. They're made in gold. And so uh, in, th in this sense, you're getting, uh, uh, you're getting an elite audience which is making extraordinarily elaborate play with these vessel forms. Uh, but metal is unfortunately for us, it's extremely easy to recycle. And so we don't have anything like the record of metal from this period, or from any period, really, that we have of stone statuary and things of that sort. Uh, sorry, I should have pressed that earlier. Um, and here you have a, a parallel which may not seem so obvious. Um, this is somebody who, who has a stealer which is outside his tomb, although we have a, a severe problem of audience with these steely the reason why it's so beautifully preserved is because it was walled up soon after it was put in position on the tomb. And so the paint gets preserved. Um, very few people ever saw this. Uh, it might even have been walled up maybe at the time of the funeral, maybe uh, with some change in plan for the tomb or something, we don't know. But what I want to draw your attention to is that group there, uh, which shows it has this hand with water on it, which is a hieroglyph writing to wash. Uh, and then underneath you have a stacked set of a copper uh, libation vessel, which, uh, sorry, libation vessel, you might just say it's a pitcher, and then a recipient. It's the same idea as you had with that gold pair of vessels a moment ago, uh, but what it implies is that you have rules of hospitality and of purity, where when you take a meal, you have to wash your hands. But you can't wash your hands yourself because uh, somebody has to pour the liquid, the water over your hands. So it is also, a, there's a social message involved in this particular form, of which um, many examples are actually preserved. It, this was obviously a very widespread ritual, which was then enacted also when tombs were constructed and plenty of these are found on top of tombs or in tombs. So uh, this is the sort of conspicuous consumption, which again is part of creating an audience for your aesthetic products. So we'll go back in time about a century now, uh, but we diverge through medieval Italy first. Uh, the facade of the, of the uh, Duomo of, in Modena in Italy. Uh, and this is because this is one of the oldest buildings that I happen to know of, which has inscriptions on it which say something about who is the architect and things like that. So we have this inscription here, 
which my Latin is not great, but as you can see, it is about the architect Lanfranc, who was the master who designed the cathedral. At the same time, we have there, in the little red square, um, we have uh, this sculpted plaque on the front of the, of the cathedral, and that has a large scale inscription with a little one at the bottom. The little one at the bottom names the sculptor and says how he is the greatest, uh, the, well, not the greatest of all sculptors, but he is, the, uh, he is the best among sculptors, at least in Modena then. Uh, and, uh, but then if you look at those human scales who are conveniently walking past the Duomo, you will see that you could not read that from the ground. Uh, so one has to, unless people had much better eyesight in the Middle Ages than they do now, who's wearing glasses, um, that this has actually part of some sort of social process which actually spreads quite widely knowledge about who has, is the designer, Lanfranc, and the sculptor, because people will come up to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the facade and say, well, what's that plaque there? And somebody will then tell them what it is. And so it involves a wider audience than one, would, one might think. And one can then think about this in an Egyptian context, coming back to the first image I used. Uh, I think it was quite good for me sitting down there before I began, because that, you got the right angle on this picture. You're looking at it from the ground, and it's a very famous object because of what's on the bottom left there, um, which gives you the titles and name of Imhotep. Imhotep is, as it were, the Egyptian culture hero who is known from much later periods and was deified in the first millennium BCE. Uh, now, the problem is, how do we re reconstruct that? That's broken, as you can see, and Imhotep is... Let's see if we can pick this out. Imhotep. Uh, I, I'm, I always kill these objects. Uh, it's th that group there. Um, so it's, it's the third line down, roughly. Uh, so two reconstructions that were proposed by the person who actually first published this. There is one of them. Uh, and uh, so there, the, the crucial bit in many ways is the bottom line, which says overseer of sculptors. Uh, and so people then assumed that Imhotep, who is in any popular book on Egypt, he's said to be the architect of this pyramid complex, uh, that he, um, uh, he was said to be the sculptor, but was the architect, as if those modern distinctions need to apply. Michelangelo, I believe, was both. Uh, but that may be wrong. So we look at another reconstruction there. Uh, it's less full, but that suggests, and I think it's more likely to be right, uh, that this actually named two people. So Imhotep was named as the, the most important person, and the sculptor was named underneath. And so we, don't, we can't reconstruct the name of the sculptor. Not that that matters, I don't think. But... Uh, no other statue that any of us know about from ancient Egypt of a king has a, an inscription relating to somebody else on it. And if you were to think about anything pre, pretty modern times, of course, statuary and things like this is not inscribed with the name of the person who made it. It detracts from the object. And so this is a, an extraordinarily exceptional thing. So I don't think we can have any doubt that Imhotep was a person of the highest importance just after the king. Uh, the object itself was pretty important too. There it is uh, from the various bits and pieces of it that have been found. And so it was, it's the earliest surviving colossal statue in Egypt from the dynastic period. There are prehistoric ones known. Uh, and it has a very elaborate iconography and so on. Uh, and then there are other, we might as well set it in context. Here you have the um, the external approach to the step pyramid complex. So this is one of the most revolutionary works in the history of architecture. It is a creation in stone of the same basic types as you've seen with these enclosure walls uh, in brick uh, up to that date. But the interior is altogether more elaborate. The in interior has the step pyramid, the famous thing, which I don't show as a picture, um, as its centerpiece. 
And then it has this colonnade of entrance. The, this statue base comes from somewhere in the colonnade, but a precise location is probably not meaningful because it was so uh, modified in later times. But those columns are imitations not of brick, at least not directly of brick, uh, but they imitate flimsy materials. So evoke the idea that you would actually have enormous performances where spaces would be created for funerals and mortuary cult out of flimsy materials, uh, organic materials of various sorts. And then, as we saw with the first brick enclosure, they would then be torn down again. And so you would have an enormous participation, quite apart from the huge size of this monument and the amount of work that's involved. Uh, that's the other end of this colonnade. The roof, the concrete roof is modern, of course, and I'm not totally convinced by the reconstruction of the columns in the foreground. But uh, I would like to point out here these, this element of the ceiling, which is, has been remounted in position there, which shows you that this idea that you are imitating um, organic forms is taken a very long way. And uh, so it speaks to much wider traditions and conventions which would exist in the society as a whole. At the same time, you have other very subtle effects being created there. So th this, is, this is a reconstruction at this point. But you see that the, there is tremendous thought goes into how light plays in the structure. And uh, we all know that architects think tremendously about the use of and play of light. The fact that you have these recessed panels all around these structures is probably in part a response to the fact that a plain brick wall is one of the most boring things to look at in the world. And so, uh, and then that was moved into stone as a design element. I think that I've been cheating you a little bit. Probably these structures actually reproduced brick originals rather than taking the organic ones directly, but I can't tell. Now, uh, there is a graffito which is on the enclosure wall of the Joseph's successor, an unfinished pyramid which is nearby. And that enclosure wall was built during this person, during the first few years of this king's reign and then was buried because the design was changed. And this ink graffito is there with the name Imhotep on it. So Imhotep, actually we have two contemporary sources. It shows that he was a person of enormous importance, both from the statue and that's the only graffito we have of a person's name on a wall and on the wall of a royal tomb, not just anywhere, uh, which um, we have from this period. We have thousands of other graffiti on blocks and things, but nothing like that. <clears throat> so uh, we can very probably say that Imhotep is the master mind. Uh, he could be the architect, perhaps, but he might not have been. He might just have been in charge of the whole thing. <clears throat> and then uh, that you had somebody else who was celebrated as the sculptor. Now, uh, at this point, of course, particularly any Egyptology book you read tends to say, well, Egyptian art artists had no individuality. They worked as groups. And of course, most artists work as, work as groups anyway. Uh, and so uh, you therefore can't talk about an individual who does this. Uh, it seems very unlikely that it would be wrong to talk about an individual for this monument because it is this <coughs> extraordinary revolutionary production which must have had someone who thought it up. Um, and there is a rather imaginative reconstruction of how it might have looked from Memphis below, um, which was done by the architect, the archaeological architect who worked on the site. <coughs> now, that, that's a very ephemeral creation in one sense. The step pyramid uh, was succeeded by two or three reigns when uh, kings didn't produce great monuments, no, not ones that survive. And then the, the other style of pyramid came along. But let's just stop, uh, go into statuary for a second. So that is a statue which was found um, in the step pyramid area uh, in the 1920s. It's in the Cairo Museum. And here is a detail of the head. This statue is actually unique in type. Uh, and uh, it's not completely unique. There are fragments of other similar ones. But this is the only one that survives to any great extent. Uh, it was put inside a chamber where, which would have made it difficult to see. But we have to assume that people did see it in antiquity because we have this piece here, which is in the British Museum. 
and was found, uh, came into the British Museum conveniently 75 years before this other one was found. So we can certainly say that no modern faker created it. And uh, it has exactly the same iconography, but in style it belongs to about 300 BC. And so one has to assume that people were actually going back to this complex as late as more than 2,000 years later in order to seek their inspiration from it. And there's plenty of other evidence, which I can't go into, which shows that at other junctures in between uh, 2600 and 300, the, this complex was a source of inspiration. And that probably gives you a sense of why Imhotep is so important, only one aspect of it. Well, <clears throat> since we had a statue, we move to another statue. Uh, this is, um, uh, I've put there, Hemunu, architect of the Great Pyramid, question mark. Um, Hemunu uh, is, had the titles of vizier, that's to say the highest official in the land, and he also had the title of overseer of the king's works. Uh, he uh, was a contemporary of Khufu, the builder of the Great Pyramid. Uh, now, if you were overseer of all the king's works, you can safely say that the major king's work in that period was the pyramid. Uh, it must have absorbed a huge proportion of the product of Egypt. And it's not just that. So, of course, just to remind you, it's the one in the background in that picture. Uh, it is, uh, well, it was said to be the largest structure in mass standing on Earth uh, before the first Aswan Dam was built in the 1890s. But that depends on how you count the Great Wall of China, I guess. Um, and there is the plan of the site, which has the two later pyramids also shown. But it is clear that the planning is not just for the pyramid, but it is also for the whole site. So the, the natural slope of the site was, in, was exploited, but exactly how we can't say because the site was changed in the process of building. And the people of the very highest status were on the right there, and then the queens were in those smaller pyramids, and on the left you have people of very high but slightly lower status, including Hemunu, whose tomb is there. Which he got one of the largest ones, as you can see. So you can say that Hemunu at the same time has the oldest statue we know of this particular type, which shows a fat and prosperous man. Uh, not only that, but um, it's completely plain. And you can think of that stela I showed you, which uh, is largely hieroglyphs, very little pictorial material. And that too is contemporary very broadly contemporary, we go through a period of extraordinarily rapid change in which there is an aesthetic of plainness, which you can say is most characteristically visible in the Great Pyramid itself, and even more so in the Second Pyramid, because the structures all around the Second Pyramid eschewed all these uh, evocations of plant forms and things like that. They, were, they looked a little bit like the, um, the dining hall here or something. Perhaps, uh, perhaps not just like that. So if we move down the social scale, not very far down the social scale, of course, people constructed tombs, thousands of them in this period, people who belong to the elite. And we have this rather fine work by Hermann Juncker, which deals with this. Uh, and it's quite often you have people represented in there who we can say are artists. And so in, in one sense or another. So there you have the perfect sculptor Ihi, there he is. And he is sitting in a scene of music and dance. Uh, so there is a performance going on around him and that is done in honor of the tomb owner. He is a favored member of the tomb owner's household. And Juncker's essential argument was that this was characteristic in particular of sculptors. Sculptors can be seen in many traditions as having a higher status than other sorts of visual artists. That's a purely it's a, it's a matter of taste. There's no absolute to any of that. Uh, but um, you don't actually confine yourself to, to sculptors. You have here the outline draftsman who is there. And he is, in this case, the front figure in a group of people carrying offerings. And so uh, these, these artists, in this case, are people who either are loaned to the tomb owner by the king, so that you have a whole group of uh, 
the whole social group involved, or alternatively, they are people uh, who actually belong to a massive household which is maintained by people of the highest status. I think that both are possible and both could have existed at the same time. And we then move down a couple of hundred years, perhaps, um, and we have this tomb here, which is in the provinces. And this is one of just two or three cases <clears throat> where we can see two things. One is that somebody can be identified as the person who designs more than one tomb, the, the decoration of the tomb. We don't know about the structure. This is a rock-cut tomb. Uh, but here we have the line drawing of uh, the, just expanded from the figure immediately behind the king. And there it says, you see that... Uh, I've, I've put in quotes the word wrote. The word for to write and to paint in Egyptian is the same. Uh, and uh, so he identifies himself immediately behind the tomb owner. And he's wearing this sash across his sh shoulder, which implies that he has some sort of priestly privileges. So he's a person of very high status in context. And he's also got an extraordinarily distinctive style, which can be seen in this tomb and the other one he created. Uh, now, quite often you read in books that these artists slip themselves into these contexts, but I don't believe that this works. And I believe that if you were the tomb owner, you would surely, as patron, you are the first, also the first channel of reception of the work. The designer will show you what he's planning to do, and he'll say, and I'm going to put myself there and um, the tomb owner has to approve. I'm sure otherwise the, desi the, the designer or painter would lose his job. And so one has to assume that there is some acceptance of artistic personalities by members of the elite. May, uh, since this person had this extraordinarily distinctive style, he may very well have been somebody you didn't, uh, you didn't um, try to argue with very much. I don't know. Uh, well, um, we've got a long way to go, so we skip... 600 years, and uh, we get to a more marginal case, but still I think worth looking at. We have this inscription, very long inscription, which is an extraordinarily original piece of writing uh, about the campaigns of King Kamose. <clears throat> and uh, as you will see, bottom left, you have this man depicted, and he's identified uh, by title and name. And uh, there are other examples of this sort of thing, but they're not common. And uh, this is the only one I think I know where you've got something which is so emphatically royal. 98% of the surface is for the king, uh, where, where the, this other person is slipped in there. You have to assume, I think, that this person is the person who in some way organized the creation of the stealer. He may actually have um, been the author of the text, uh, and you say, well, I'm wandering away from visual art here, but you can also think that, the, that these things form part of performances, that um, th these texts would have been read out and uh, used as celebration of the, king's, of the king's deeds. So it's not simply a visual product uh, as, as a piece of text, it's also a, a performance. Now, at the same place in the Temple of Karnak, you have uh, evidence for some dissemination of works of art in other ways. Uh, so uh, there is an imaginative reconstruction of the temple complex. You've got this enormous wall that surrounds it. Only certain people can go inside. The route by which you normally went, we'll see in a second, actually, that's probably better. Uh, this is the southernmost end of the whole complex, uh, which is there. There's another complex to the right. And outside it, there are groups of statuary including colossal statues of, of the king. So people could come up to here and they could then uh, probably do religious things there. They would ask for oracles, they would place votive offerings or something of that sort. It, what we might know about this from archaeology, we don't, because all of this was cleared for tourism in the 19th century. Um, and then uh, within the temple, thousands of statues built up. And there you have top right in about 1905, they found in this court here a huge pit which had hundreds and hundreds of statues in it. Uh, and so in, sometime in about the third century BCE, it must have been decided that there was too much clutter in the temple and it was all buried. 
And we have to remember only hard stone statues come out of there. You can see that they got down to the water table in that excavation, and then they gave up. Uh, there is probably still more statuary in that pit. Um, and so the hard stone statues survive, the limestone ones probably don't, and the wooden ones certainly don't. So there would have been thousands and thousands of statues throughout the Temple of Karnak. And we can tell archaeologically that they were everywhere, but there are still people could only go a little way into people being normal people, not priests, or maybe, maybe high-ranking people on special occasions. Otherwise, this enormous complex is essentially there for the gods. It's not for you and me. Uh, in fact, when you go to Karnak now, on one day, you might see more people there than you would have seen in 100 years in antiquity. Uh, and so here you have Amenhotep son of Hapu, uh, a famous Egyptian who, in a later period, was um, also deified like Imhotep. And let's just show you for a second. Um, that the location where that statue was found corresponds to the left of those um, uh, <coughs> of those uh, rings there. It's um, the right-hand one of the, that group. It was in front of this pylon. That's the furthest into the temple that anyone could go. We know that lots of people saw that statue and admired it and respected it for two reasons. One is the inscription around the base invites you to present offerings to it so that he will then transmit them inside the temple. At the same time, the, the lap, you can't see that, is, being, is very worn where thousands of people have scraped it over the years. It's made of a very hard stone. But we also can say that it has another form of reception. That's, that would be a religious reception. Here we have an artistic reception from this statue here, uh, also from Karnak. And there are two features which show that the, that the statue on the right must derive its, uh, its inspiration from the statue on the left. You've got that group of hieroglyphs on the front of the first statue, and you have an identical group on the front of the second statue. And that, uh, on the first statue, it's unique. So, so you, uh, the, he couldn't have used another statue to inspire him with that because the writing is displaced to the left in order to allow it to run the whole way around the statue. Uh, the same is done on the other statue where it is no longer meaningful. Uh, the other point is that the first statue was clearly damaged in the course of its manufacture and they had to bevel the corner. And that beveling of the corner, I think, is the inspiration for the curve on the other statue uh, on the front, because Egyptian statues don't have curved fronts. This is, I don't know if it's unique, but it's certainly very rare. But of course, the later person, in a, this is in a period of artistic revival around 650, uh, clearly does not use the old statue as something to copy. This is something which is where particular features of the old statue are inspiration for the later one, which then does something entirely different. So whoever creates that statue, um, whoever commissions it and creates it, has a huge repertory of, the, of knowledge of the past, which is got from looking at many ancient works. And at this point, uh, when I'm, I've been talking about how things are restricted, at the same time they're not so very restricted because, of course, monuments fall into disuse and people in later periods went to old monuments, they threw copy grids over the surfaces to copy them and uh, very often these monuments were completely decayed and you could get into areas, as modern tourists can, where you couldn't have done you know, when the monument was created. So you have a, an artistic reuse of the past which goes far beyond any uh, of the rules that might have applied to these works when they were created. And in fact, probably any tomb uh, would actually have a currency of just two or three generations. After that, it's an ancient work where you can go look at it if you want, uh, but it doesn't have the, the same sort of restrictions applying to it. So. Contemporary with the statue on the right is this one on the left from another part of Egypt in the Delta, um, which, as you can see, uses the same basic pose, in fact, in quite some detail, but is completely different in artistic style. And so, again, you have to assume uh, two opposite points, really. One is that these people are using a huge range of older works to create these later ones. And the second is that they use a very diverse range of models. <clears throat> and I think if I were asked, I would say that the statue on the left is really very original in its conception, the one on the right a bit less so. <clears throat> uh, and 
uh, but I can, I can be fairly confident that the facial type of the statue on the left looks back to the early second millennium, whereas the basic bodily form is something that goes back to the third millennium. So these are works which combined all sorts of inspirations. Of course, you can all dismiss anything like this if you want to be nasty about works of art. You say, well, it's eclectic, so it's not worth anything, but I don't think that's a reasonable way to approach it. Um, so we can, we can look at another, very briefly, just one image here. Uh, here is a wall in a temple which was incompletely executed. What they did was they painted this entire temple in a reduced range of colors, and that was a temporary step until they got, had the time to carve it. Uh, under the next reign, they went, came back and began to carve it, but didn't finish, as you can see. So you have a design which was executed in paint, and then if you had the, the carving completed, you wouldn't know that this had been executed because the paint would be completely effaced and then, in an ideal case, replaced by another layer of paint. Uh, but in more detail, we can then think about what this implies. So there is a figure of the king, and he's, um, his top half has been carved to some extent, and uh, extraordinarily vir virtuoso execution goes on here. Uh, the original painted form, as you can see, is very beautifully executed. Um, and then it's worth pointing out his artificial tail, which was done with a single stroke of the brush. Uh, so whoever did this, who was a member of a team, as I, we've been saying, was a virtuoso painter whose work was temporary. Uh, but then when we come to the king's face, there's another aspect of this. So probably this carving is not the work of only one person. I would think that whoever did the, the line of the back probably um, roughed it out crudely and then somebody else comes along and smooths it because you will have people at different stages of expertise. Uh, whoever did the hand did a beautiful job. But the face is left out entirely, and that is presumably because this is the king's face, and the king's face has to be done by the boss. And so, one should think, therefore, that there is actually a whole hierarchy of people involved. You can also think we are inside a temple. Probably people observe certain rules of purity and things like that in order to be doing this in the first place. And maybe whoever carved the king's face had to be of a certain status, bear certain titles, or whatever it might be. I pointed out a pre um, an artist who has a priestly sash, and that could be part of the refinement of all of this. Well, the last group of things we have, you'll be pleased to hear, is uh, from Greek Roman period temples. Uh, so we've skipped down another eight, 900 years or something like that. And here we are in the court of the Temple of Edfu. And the Temple of Edfu was built over a period of about 180 years, from something like 230 to 70 BCE. And yet it seems to have a single plan. Um, uh, so there was uh, um, an extraordinary elaboration in design that happened before anything was done. Now, uh, that applies to the architectural form. Whether all the scenes at Edfu were done that way, I would very much doubt. I imagine that they were developed. And indeed, we can show that certain aspects of the way the, uh, the decoration was designed evolved during this period. Uh, but there is the temple. Now, we can very safely say that very few people went beyond that broken little doorway in the middle uh, because uh, if you went in as a priest, you didn't go in that way. You went in on the side because there are inscriptions that show that. Uh, and maybe people came in for the festivals. But again, we're talking about something which is dedicated essentially to the gods. Um, now, I was going to mention two books which... Uh, one might think about you. Know, nobody can find that book, unfortunately. That was a privately published birthday present of the author to people. Uh, but in there, he, he writes a little piece of fiction about how the designer of the Temple of Edfu had a problem. He didn't know how to fill these acres of wall with suitable stuff. So he went to a relative he had in Thebes and got some inspiration from him. And uh, it's a work of fiction, but it is based on on details which show that the slightly early de earlier decoration of things in Thebes is very close to what you had at Edfu, 
and you have also a name that you can identify with the person who was involved in the decoration in Thebes. So that's why you can write a little work of fiction about it. But you should also think that Edfu is the back of beyond in ancient Egypt, although it's a pretty remarkable temple because the, where people really who mattered were was in the delta where all the temples have been spread as lime on the fields, so we don't have them. Uh, the other work that I'm, <coughs> I'm going to more detail, this one is by Pier Zignani, and it's about the architecture of the temple of Dendera, the other great surviving temple of the period, a later temple. Uh, this is the only extensive architectural survey that's been done of one of these temples. We have to be grateful to the French government for it. Um, and so we'll look at Dendera. There it is. And uh, you can see that we can date the front to a precise year. Uh, and it's worth picking out certain features of the front. Um, so the Temple of Dendera is very um, unusual but not unique among Egyptian temples in having these sistrum capitals on to the columns, which are for the goddess Hathor. Uh, and uh, many features also take that up. Just about visible on that enlargement is the, uh, the lower level has the head, a sistrum head, which evokes the idea of Hathor, and that motif implies that the sun shines on the temple. It, it, it means the temple at the same time. We'll come back in a moment to that one. Uh, and the temple has extraordinary features of design, notably this use of, of multiple different stones. So that uh, lintel, well, broken lintel block there is made of granodiorite, whereas all the rest of the temple, bar some parts, is made of sandstone. There must be some underlying idea to that. It's extremely rare to find this mixed use of stone. And um, every single square inch of the temple is decorated, uh, all with meaningful materials, and many of them of designs that you don't see in earlier periods. Uh, that's just giving you this, um, I don't know if you can see that, barely. Uh, but this idea that the sun passes through the temple is evoked here and here. Uh, where you have a sun disk to bring that to mind. But in many ways, the most remarkable feature, sorry, that's just arrowing in to show you where you are, is the thickness of the top of the facade. Because there is three, uh, an inscription on there in three lines of Greek, which says that it was commissioned by the emperor Tiberius and by the prefect of Egypt, whose name I can't remember, and the epistrategus, the next highest official, whose name I also can't remember, they're both Roman names, and then the strategos, the local high official who is, has a Greek name. So you get a, a, a chain of commissioning right up to the Roman emperor. But even the Roman emperor is not powerful enough to get an inscription placed on the Temple of Dendera which is visible. Uh, obviously, you cannot see that. The height, it's about 25 meters up or something like that, and it could only be seen very early in the morning because the sun moves away from the facade anyway. Uh, so the gods, I suppose, knew about this, but the, the Egyptian, the indigenous Egyptian culture of the Greek Roman period was so amazingly powerful that it was able to maintain this, this world of the temples, which is there for the gods, and you can say, you could say for the elite, but actually by this date, even the indigenous elite was in severe retreat. Um, and uh, the Hellenistic world was confined to outside the enclosure. Uh, this is just to show you other aspects of this. So this is important, I think, because of thinking about this aspect of art architectural design. You can see on this side view that you've got a vertical line running up the structure. And that, that you would say, contradicts normal practices in masonry. Um, and there, are, there is also a joint between the right-hand part, which was built earlier, and the higher front part. And that joint has actually opened out a little bit. And um, Pier Zignani uh, uses parallels to show that this is done in order to take account of settlement and possible earthquake damage. So in engineering terms, this is an extraordinarily sophisticated structure. Uh, and you can then see the amazing level of detail that is executed everywhere. There is this frieze element, which is, and frieze elements are varied room to room, inside and out, and so on, and with greater inventiveness than you see elsewhere. And then there is a, a very large scale figure of the king, uh, and he has, he's wearing a garment which shows him smiting his enemies and his pet lion chewing them. 
Uh, and so that uh, brings to life an image of the king. Now, uh, the king is, when I call him the king, it is the king of Egypt. It's some Roman emperor. I can't remember who that particular relief is named for. We can safely say the Roman emperor had nothing direct to do with this. This is the great local monument, which has to do with the elite. But I've given you all these provisos. Maybe they couldn't actually come in much to see it. You see the grooving on the surface here. And that is a mark of people coming along and using the temple as a magical resource. Uh, but it's too high up to reach from the ground. And so it's probably early medieval in date. Uh, but uh, there is some grooving which is at base level. And the grooving at base level, somebody who's written a book about the temple suggests, shows you that you would kind of bribe the priests to come along and get you a little bit of this precious substance. And they would, everyone would know what was involved because the areas that are most heavily grooved are the ones nearest the sanctuary. So the temple shows also extraordinary precision in design in its interior. So you have these lines here which are drawn to show you that at least the inner part of the temple has an absolutely consistent approach to how the doorways are structured. Uh, and uh, that is done both in plan and in elevation. Uh, the use of light, if we go back to what I was saying about the step pyramid here, the light is very sparse in the temple, but it is extraordinarily precisely angled by these windows, which are let partly into the roof, partly into the joint between roof and wall, and, and in some other places. And then <clears throat> there is an example where the resurrecting of God Osiris is set in a funnel roof, a funnel window. Mostly these windows are funnel shaped, so that they get as much light as a very small opening can produce. The resurrecting Osiris is directly in the, the window, and underneath you have the winged disc, which signifies the passage of the sun. And here you have a room in the temple, and the angle of the window shown uh, uh, on these drawings. Uh, so that, there's the window, and there is how, at different times of year, it will penetrate in different ways. Uh, and, uh, but at its maximum, uh, sorry, uh, not at its maximum, at its minimum, it will, at certain angles, fill the room. And so this has to be extremely precisely calculated with knowledge of the passage of the sun and things like this, which you can also uh, think about in relation to the fact that the measurement of the circumference of the Earth in the 3rd century BC in Alexandria is thought to be commemorated in a hieroglyph that was created in Elephantine at the, um, at the other end of Egypt. So the Egypt, these people are actually involved in the geometric and other culture of their period, although they're not using the Hellenistic artistic style. That's just a detail showing you how this even goes into the staircase, which we'll see for another moment. There is the light, as he's actually photographed it, moving into the staircase. So that is all the result of extraordinarily precise calculation and implies that whoever designed the temple is a member of a much wider elite which um, is involved probably with Alexandrian culture as well as with indigenous Egyptian culture. But what about the local people who were in charge? So these are a couple of objects which were dedicated in the temple um, by members of the local elite a little bit earlier, probably about 50 BC, um, uh, a silver and a bronze object. And uh, some of these people were actually ethnically or culturally, is perhaps a better way to put it, culturally Greek or Hel Hellenic. And here is somebody who is a little bit mixed in culture. And he was, as it says on the caption, he was um, uh, one of the leading officials of, his, of the period in the whole of Upper Egypt. But his statue seems to come from Dendera. Uh, and so he, you could say, is somebody who probably was involved in the commissioning of the temple. But it's such an enormous project that I can't believe that it, it stopped there. We might think it stopped with someone like him. Uh, in other words, that the king uh, in Alexandria would be involved. He probably wouldn't know much about what the temple meant or anything like that, but the people who did the design were part of this wider culture. We can also think about him uh, because uh, Augustus, as he later became the conqueror, Roman conqueror of Egypt, uh, for his reign, it's possible to show that um, very detailed features of the execution of temple reliefs 
reflected changes in his titulary in the first few years of his reign. So there's an extraordinary level of involvement right up to the top of society. I don't think Augustus himself said, I want that title there, uh, but we have to assume that there is a, an apparatus which goes to the very top. And since I was really talking about temples, let's go back to the temple and think about the way in which you can celebrate things in the temple in paradoxical senses. So the temple is characterized by having um, these rooms in the thickness and also staircases in the thickness. You start with that staircase there, and you go up onto the roof where there's a further suite of rooms for the god Osiris, you saw an example, and then you come down by another staircase. Once a year, all the statues in the temple are taken onto the roof in order to, um, uh, to re revive in the sunlight at New Year. And they do it in this kiosk here. Now, the kiosk, as you can see from the elevation, is invisible from the outside world. So that is there for the gods. But that doesn't stop it from being a dazzling work of architecture in itself. Uh, and it is entirely decorated. It must have had temporary, a temporary roof put on it. You can see from this groove in the lintels. Uh, and so at a point like this, uh, these... Uh, things were being celebrated for the gods. The gods are the most important audience, but in practice, the gods and the priests who make these celebrations, other celebrations which we can't document, which go out into the countryside, uh, and um, the people who commission this are forming the wider audience. And this is a culture that manages to maintain itself, even though the number of people who actually could read any of this material must have been vanishingly small. The, some of the most difficult of all Egyptian inscriptions are on the Temple of Dendera uh, because uh, the writing of hieroglyphs was divorced from other forms of writing and so became something which was an, only for the initiate. And this is ultimately brings the seeds of the disappearance of Egyptian culture, but not for some hundreds of years after this. So we will stop with that. Thank you. <coughs> I overran a bit. Okay. Thanks. Can you hear me okay with this mic? No? It's the weird because it's down and then you look out and it doesn't really... Is that better? Yes. Okay. Unlike Professor Baines, I am going to speak from text. Um, okay, in his exploration of the roles and identities of artists and audiences in ancient Egypt, Professor Baines has touched on a wide range of material and topics. In my response to his talk, I would like to focus on just a couple of themes that underlie this work and that have broader implications for our understanding of Egyptian visual culture. Essential to this talk is the central centralizing of aesthetics, or perhaps more neutrally, the centralizing of form and visual experience. It's an ironic thing about the study of ancient Egyptian art. Here's a civilization that left behind an incredibly rich body of visual and material culture that is surely one of the most visually distinctive in the history of art in the world, and yet the topic of aesthetics, or form, has long proven to be especially difficult for Egyptologists to interrogate, with the result being a rather burdensome gap in the scholarship. Some contributing factors to this dilemma may be found in early art historical work, when inquiries into the nature and significance of form, or style specifically, took as their source material art from the Western tradition, a tradition that chose classical Greece as its seminal moment, building a philosophical framework on a largely European foundation. Situated within this framework, which is unavoidably exterior to Egypt, analyses of Egyptian styles were inevitably inhibited by the ultimately futile project of measuring the achievements of ancient Egyptians against the desires of Greeks and Romans, or Wolflin and Gombrich. In addition, early choices to isolate evolutions of visual traditions as the true course of art historical concern 
meant that the overarching and enduring stylistic consistency of Egyptian two- and three-dimensional art rendered that visual culture almost absent somehow from the history of art. Yet Professor Baines makes clear, both in this talk and a lot of other work that he's done, that the style of Egyptian visual culture is not about the absence of artistic concern. The maintenance of such a distinctive visual tradition over thousands of years is the result of a persevering intent and painstaking efforts continuously performed within a complex, dynamic environment of knowledge and communication. The stylistic consistency does not suggest, on the part of the ancient Egyptians, a disinterest in material form. Rather, it expresses the opposite. They were indeed aware of and highly invested in the powerful impact of the form of images and objects. It is in part because the stylistic consistency served the interest of a collective, that is the elite of ancient Egypt, that the place of the artist, as we define him in that academic discourse, is obscured. Professor Bain's underlying concern for aesthetics sets a path toward constructing a clearer picture of the role of artistic production in ancient Egypt. Professor Baines considered a very wide spatiotemporal range of diverse objects and monuments, but he identified architecture as the premier aesthetic form and most importantly, aesthetic context. This issue of context is fundamental. Egyptian objects and images were not designed to stand alone, but rather were created for a broader context. An architectural monument, such as the many that were discussed in this talk, provided the arenas for the formal elements of these objects of art to interact. There was the architectural structure itself, the solid element of the building, the shaping of the space with the plan, the manipulation of light and dark that you saw a lot about, um, the walls, the columns, the ceilings, all of the surfaces covered with painted or relief carved images and texts that were organized purposefully throughout the space of the building, and statuary distributed equally purposefully throughout the interior and exterior spaces of a building. But Egyptian architecture is not only about spatial context. All of these formal elements work together to construct an environment charged with religious and social significance, and one that was fully aestheticized, lifting the space up from the secular beauty of their natural environment into a sort of supernatural space that was an appropriate context for the conducting of ritual. At several points, Professor Baines noted the important role of ritual and performance to the meaning of the monuments left behind to us. And he furthermore noted our understanding that these rituals themselves were fully aestheticized, from the clothing and the accoutrement of the participants to the use of flowers and incense and perfume, the sounds of prayers and music, the orchestration of movement, all of this together with the carefully crafted objects and constructed environment. Noting the complexity inherent in such performance and given the strong aesthetic character of all the constituent elements, Professor Baines suggests that our concept of artistic production in ancient Egypt should rightly include the rituals themselves not only their execution, but their organization, their design as well, the orchestration of people and monuments as artistic enterprise. This theme of orchestration and context can be linked back to the question of artists' identities. Professor Baines discussed the role of architects, citing, for one example, Hemiunu, um, an elite official who held the title Overseer of Works during the reign of Khufu. As Professor Baines noted, the title does not specify Hemiunu's artistic vision in the design of the pyramid, yet this lack of specificity is no doubt intended. Professor Baines also noted that the pyramid was only one element in a much larger project involving not only royal temples, but the planning and construction of the surrounding elite cemetery. We may suppose that as overseer of works with such works going on, that Hemiunu's responsibilities exceeded mere design. For example, orchestrating the activities of likely many designers, planners, and executants or builders, and that the general nature of overseer of works purposefully refers to the import of such a broad range of responsibilities, linking them together functionally, as well as in terms of status and contribution to the state administration. Thus, we may see a parallel, perhaps, in the orchestration of the production of these large architectural complexes to the orchestration of the rituals conducted within with both projects involving a variety of kinds of work, including significant aesthetic choices and execution of the means to produce them. On the one hand, this diversifying of aesthetic responsibilities may hint at why it is so difficult for us to identify individuals responsible for the form of specific projects. 
But it also hints at, for me, another aspect of this inquiry that has to do with how the Egyptians perceived the relationship between the artist and the object or the monument he produced. So despite even this expanded definition of artistic production, a gap remains in our knowledge about artists and their work. We know that ancient Egyptians valued aesthetics and artistic skill. Professor Baines made that clear in his talk, and it's obvious to us in the material that survived. We also know that the Egyptians valued artists. As Professor Baines pointed out, artists were often depicted and identified in elite tomb programs, which in Egypt is a marker of status. And in fact, a number of artists had tombs of their own, which indicates an even higher level of status. The simple existence of titles that relate to artistic activity is indicator enough. Titles belong to the elite, the small percentage of citizens that were part of the administration. So with these depictions, tombs, and titles, do come names. We do, in fact, know the names of numerous artists from ancient Egypt. Surely, only a very, very, very tiny percentage. But we do have information about specific people who were artists in ancient Egypt. Thus, it is not that we lack the identities of any artists in ancient Egypt. Rather, the larger gap occurs in our knowledge about which artists produced which object or monument. We lack the connection between the artist and the work he produced. It is clear from the material that has survived that the ancient Egyptians did not prioritize this aspect of artistic work. While they valued the artist and they valued the object, they did not express either of these things by linking the two together, by anchoring the object to the artist. And I'd suggest that this perspective for the ancient Egyptians was linked to their larger worldview, one in which, theoretically, each citizen from pharaoh to farmer had a specific role to play. And if all played the role to which they were born, Egypt would succeed and thrive. The community is emphasized over the individual, and the individual's importance is his active and specific contribution to that community. For artists, this means it was the act of producing the objects and monuments so essential to elite culture that was the focal point of their value, that gave them their status in their lives. Rather than claiming works of art that were perceived, after all, to exist in an eternal realm, distinct from that of any ephemeral individual. I would argue that this view, while pervasive, was likely an ideal in the way that the worldview was an ideal. It's not coincidental that the place we do see artists depicted and identified is not in royal monuments, but rather in elite ones, ones that existed on a much smaller scale with reference to a narrower community and less central to the functioning of the state. To underline this point, I'd like to briefly return to the tomb of Kahep, the one that had the inscription of Seni in it um, that was mentioned previously by Professor Baines. The inscription of Seni is indeed extremely unusual among ancient Egyptian monuments, but it is not, only the, not, not the only distinctive quality of this tomb program, and I think Professor Baines mentioned this at well, as well. The tomb program has a distinctive style. It is subtle, to be sure. It's based primarily on the artist's use of alternating color patterns, but it's visually distinctive and it's easily perceived. It's significant that the distinctive style and the unusual inscription occur together and that they occur in a provincial rather than a Memphite or capital city tomb, even further outside the mainstream world of idealized monuments. Seni takes a rare opportunity afforded him in this provincial site to assert his status via his signature of sorts, but he also displays his particular artistic skill vision even, which means it is something that he clearly perceives to be valuable and part of his identity, a sense he would likely only have if it were one shared by his wider community. In archaeology, we look for patterns, but it is often the variation from those patterns that can be most telling. In this case, Seni does something that is not typical, elevating his individuality in a space meant to communicate membership and belonging. But the choices he makes hint at the ideas and beliefs of his society, that artistic ability, form, and aesthetics were valued by the audiences of ancient Egypt. This example, I think, reaffirms Professor Bain's centralizing of aesthetics, and it also suggests potentially fruitful paths of further investigation, looking for artists and the question of aesthetics along the boundaries of the ideals. I'd like to conclude with just one last note about the significance of Professor Bain's talk and his work on a sort of larger scale. Um, as I touched on at the beginning, there remains a divide between the discipline of art history and the study of ancient Egyptian art. And this is, I think, ultimately detrimental to both. I think a large part of the problem has been historically this framework that I referred to, and especially even the language used, 
Words like portraiture, landscape, or aesthetics, or even art and artists, come with meanings that are difficult to apply to Egyptian material. I think too many people in both fields have decided the best response is to avoid the topics altogether, which is clearly not ideal. What Professor Bain's talk here shows is that avoidance is less productive than engaging these questions and themes and trying to find ways to reconcile that divide. In so doing, this kind of work helps to open up the dialogue with scholars of other fields of art history and to encourage those who deal with Egyptian art to expand their fields of inquiry. Ultimately, hopefully, this can lead to more productive work, a more dynamic discourse. And this, I personally see as an especially significant aspect of this talk and Professor Bain's work overall. Thank you. So, so, any questions from? Does that work? Yeah. <laughs> work. So, I have a mic for people who have questions, and uh, Professor Baines will entertain. Okay. Is there some? All right. My question is about the um, pictorial regimes at this last. Um, temple that you showed, Dandara. Um, I, I should first say that uh, my field of expertise is far away from this. I work on China, but there's a lot of, uh, I'd say, common ground between ancient Chinese uh, tombs and, and Egyptian in the sense that um, uh, most of what remains uh, that we can find today and, and dig uh, archaeologically was not meant to be seen. There was a limited audience, um, and that the makers are largely absent from the history. So having said that, I just wonder something about patterns, uh, pictorial patterns. I noticed that there were many areas where you could say that um, the decor, the, the um, motifs were uh, meant to be decorative, that is, uh, very tight and sort of repetitive. And then um, on the, the side view of the, the large building where you showed sort of a colossal in, inscribed um, large figure, um, perhaps the king, made me think that there were several different types of aesthetic regimes going on, that the same kind of motifs are not appropriate for every place on, the, on these buildings, on the outside in particular, where one would imagine there would be a considerable audience even if it were um, limited, that one would expect you could see it as opposed to you know, being down uh, inside in the tomb. So I wonder if you could talk about maybe how the artists went about sort of designing something like this in the sense of deciding what types of motif would go where. That, it's a big question. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm just checking. Yes, the, the microphone is working. Uh, yes, well, um, the, there's a whole range of issues in what you say there. Um, uh, undoubtedly, you have various different areas which have different styles and meanings attached to them. Um, in the Greek or Roman period, you've singled out this fact that you get some figures shown as a colossal scale on the outside, and they are presumably there to speak to the largest audience that will get to see it. Very hard to say how many people they are. Um, but there was actually a particular interest in that case. You've got very repetitive materials that go around the base, uh, and they are le less important, but they are separated from those more important larger reliefs by a line of inscription. And that line of inscription has the most difficult in, um, hieroglyphic composition on it of anywhere. Uh, indeed, people still can't understand some of these texts. And one has to assume that this is a display element, which is very important for the, uh, for the community that is involved in the design of the temple. Uh, it, the content of the inscription is about the building of the temple. Uh, so there is a case where you've got something which, in a sense, is visually, it's just a divider between two parts of the, of the thing, but at the same time, it conveys a lot of meaning. Uh, and then the further up you move, uh, basically, you have the base, which I think signifies the created world, roughly speaking. The middle area signifies the, the ideally ordered divine world in which only the, the king and the gods can participate. 
And then the top signifies the sky. That's a very obvious sort of way to split it up. But the top has many small-scale repetitive elements which evoke things uh, in specific cases which have to do with, um, with astronomy, so the path of the sun, the constellations and things like this. And indeed, the Temple of Dandera has uh, the only, uh, not the only, sorry, one of very few Egyptian pictures of the zodiac, so that it, it, that's a sort of new piece of astronomy because it's a Babylonian concept which came to Egypt. Uh, and so you've got the, these zones of meaning in the, different, uh, in the different levels of the decoration. And as you move into the temple, in the inner parts, it's different from the outer parts. So it's organized both for meaning and for visual effect. Um, there is an extraordinary set of pictures I discovered. They've recently cleaned the ceiling of the main area. And uh, uh, you have to put up a lot of scaffolding to do this. And uh, there is this fantastically beautiful execution of these friezes and decorative elements and also astronomical elements on the ceiling, which, um, again, the, the problem, hardly anyone could see it. Because it was brightly colored, you could see it better. It would certainly give a wonderful visual impression even though it was pretty much too far away to see in any detail. So uh, again, there's this mania to get to, to complete everything, which influences the design and takes it probably beyond anything that could, uh, could in all cases have a direct aesthetic effect. So other considerations are coming in there too. I don't know if that answers you at all. <laughs> <coughs> Um, in the tomb of uh, Count Caney, I think it was, um, you suggested that, uh, that it was the artist's idea to uh, depict himself in a prominent position and that the patron sort of went along with that. Um, is it possible that that was the patron's idea and that the artist is somehow notable or reputable enough so that uh, the patron is proud of employing this particular artist? It's quite possible. I don't, uh, that's an equally good way of looking at it, I think. Uh, the only question I would wonder about is how much liberty these artists have. In other words, suppose, uh, suppose this artist, um, that there he is, he lives in this provincial place. Does he have a choice of working for another patron or something like that? So we don't know if there's any sort of sense of a market of artists. But um, uh, I think it, it, it would make good sense to think that that this person who clearly had produces exceptional style and composition could, uh, would, was obviously valued because that's why that is there. And it, it could indeed be that it's the opposite way around to what I said. Uh, um, I just have this slight uncomfortableness thinking about how the artists would be commissioned and so on. And I can't answer that. <clears throat> As a modernist, I knew absolutely nothing about <laughs> that. But I was very struck by one element. To, uh, I, may, I might have misunderstood one thing that you said. But I think you said that at some point, the the, the carvings, the decorative carvings, were contradicting the architectural. You know, uh, uh, it was on the, uh, on the outside of the, the last temple you showed, kind of like in in, con in disjunction with the architectural uh, uh, you know, uh, geometry, and. Uh, and I was thinking of that in terms of the, the light, the use of light, which, which is, as you, as you described, so crucial. Would the light be considered to be strictly on the order of the architect's decision? I, you know, do we know if there was a kind of conjunction there? Because if, uh, if um, some carving are flush with light, they also kind of disappear in the architect. So it, I just wonder what was the relationship between the you know, sculptor carvers and the architects? Were they, did they feel kind of competition or kind of, uh, you know, do we know any of that? Well, we know something about how um, sculptors and painters work together because they seem to work together not very well <clears throat> in the sense that you will have a painting uh, which um, is the point of departure for something that's carved and then the sculptor comes along and he ignores the lines because on unfinished works you see that sort of thing. Uh, and then somebody should come back after that and paint the, the sculpted uh, relief and then 
beautifully detailed carving in, in the stone is then covered with plaster and painted with entirely different motifs <laughs> over the top. Well, that's, that's war. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we... uh, there may be a change in taste, of course, it may be that, you know, 30 years. Yes. But, but uh, the, there's the basic point you make about how, how light blinds the sculpture. That's taken care of by using sunk relief on, the, on exteriors. Sunk relief takes the light much better than raised relief does. And one or, in, one, in one period, they decided to reverse this convention. And they have enormous figures that are in raised relief on exteriors, but they're very difficult to see. Uh, but I, don't th I think we, it would be rare that you would find that the design kind of contradicts the architectural form. What you do find is that the rigid um, squares into which the design is organized and things like that are then subverted by the, by the content that goes within. So people are very conscious of playing with the potential of their forms. <clears throat> okay. I, I think we should uh, go to, if we don't want the reception to be packed before we go, I think we should, uh, we all invite to reception in food hall. Let's just say thank you, Professor Bates. Thank you. Thank you.